you to what is described in the conference program as energy landscape, which is a fairly bland and boring title. Um, but we're going to cover, as Jim suggested this morning, some very interesting and from a strategic political perspective, some very complicated ground. Our starting point as a way of kicking this off is a series of events that have taken place in recent months in and around that part of Iraq administered by the Kurdish Regional Government, or KRG. In April, the KRG announced it was suspending exports of oil via Iraq's kirkuk Jehan pipeline, essentially due to, as the Kurds tell it, Baghdad's failure to pay the KRG for exports from Kurdistan the previous year. The timing was interesting. The announcement immediately preceded a visit by KRG President Masoud Barzani to Washington, Ankara, and other major capitals, where he described at some length his sense of a growing dysfunction in Iraq as a result of the policies of Prime Minister Maliki. A month later, the KRG's newly sworn in uh, Prime Minister, Nitrivan Barzani, also visited Ankara. And like President Barzani, he received a warm welcome and had high profile discussions at the highest levels of the Turkish state, including a lot of face time with Prime Minister Erdogan. On the 20th of May, KRG Energy Minister Ashti Havrami, with Turkey's Energy Minister standing next to him with a big smile, announced at a conference in Erbil that the KRG in Turkey had reached agreement on a series of steps involving direct KRG energy exports across the Turkey-Iraq border. The trade would begin in trucks transporting oil and uh, refined product on a barter basis, but it looked toward commissioning by 2013 of the first of a series of dedicated oil pipelines capable of transporting by 2019 over 2 million barrels of crude a day to Jehan. Minister Havrami indicated that additional pipelines would bring or could bring 10 to 15 BCM of gas to Turkey in two to three years and an additional 10 BCM by 2015. Turkey has not officially confirmed Dr. Ashti's announcements, but neither has it denied it. For those who follow these things, this was a big deal. The air bill announcement in effect brought together a number of strands, each very important in its own right, that have been discussed at conferences like this literally for years. One is Turkey's energy picture, a picture characterized by a scarcity of resources within its borders and a consequent imported energy bill that has chronically swelled its current account deficit. A picture characterized by over-reliance on a few sometimes problematic sources of supply for its growing energy requirements and a consequent need to diversify those sources. A picture characterized by its position between some energy rich neighbors and some energy poor markets and a consequent opportunity to become a serious hub or a transit country. Another issue that we've talked about a lot at these gatherings in the past is the issue of the Kurds of northern Iraq. Now that discussion has generally been about security issues, specifically how to deal with the PKK a perennial bone of contention between Turks and Kur Iraqi Kurds. But as I suggested a moment ago, things have changed. There has been a dramatic evolution in ankara Erbil relations in recent years. Turkish commentators who not so long ago described KRG leaders as tribal leaders, or worse, now write about a budding strategic partnership. One undergird by trade relations worth billions and by the renewed proof profile for Turkey of Kurdish issues both at home and in Syria next door. And then there's the hardy perennial of these conferences, Iraq, its future, its relationship to Turkey, and the American role there now and in the future. Like it or not, many Turks, many Kurds in my experience, see Washington as an enabler of the Maliki government in Baghdad and of its policies. And they often describe the prime minister and those policies as a greater threat to Iraq's integrity than any aspirations the Kurds of Iraq may have or actions they may have taken. And of course, the tone of Turkey's relationships with Baghdad recently has deteriorated in direct proportion to the warming and intensification 
of its relations with the KRG. And finally, there's the question of how this picture relates back into the energy big picture. I've spent much of the last two years working with Dick Morningstar to promote a southern gas corridor to, uh, to help both Turkey and Europe diversify their sources of gas. An important part of that discussion has been where do you get the gas? Without revealing any secrets, I can tell you that Iraq generally, and northern Iraq specifically, got a lot of our attention. I've seen estimates that the KRG, in addition to 45 billion barrels or so of oil, may have as much as 50 to 100 trillion cubic feet of gas. With sources like Iran becoming problematic, those are important numbers for energy diplomats of any nationality. And as Turkey's energy minister pointed out in Erbil, standing next to the KRG's energy minister, it's all right next door to Turkey. So as I said, some interesting and complicated ground we have to discuss this morning. And to help us cover it, as Jim has suggested, we have an unusually qualified panel. The bios have been circulated. Um, Vlad Sokar is a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation uh, and is among the best informed, most incisive analysts of international pipeline diplomacy in the business, uh, uh, a capacity I've respected even when on occasion Dick Morningstar and I have been the subject of some of his criticism. Uh, John Hanna is a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. His May 31st article in Foreign Policy is, to my mind, the best piece written in this country to date on the issues we we're going to be discussing. I highly recommend it, and I'm sure John will draw on it in his remarks. Kubad Talabani is the KRG's resident Washington representative. After many years of very competently telling the Kurd story here, he'll soon return to Erbil for the next stage in what I'm sure will be a long and promising career. And finally, my old friend Jim Jeffrey is, I guess, strictly speaking, still our ambassador in Baghdad, at least until his replacement arrives to present credentials. But he's in the final days of a much delayed retirement from a remarkably long and distinguished career in our diplomatic service, during which he has served in some of the highest positions that the Foreign Service or our, any service has to offer, including Deputy National Security Advisor and Ambassador to, in addition to Baghdad, Ankara and Tirana. That's Tirana, not Tehran. <clears throat> We're going to try to keep this informal. Rather than fixed presentations, I will start by asking each of our panelists a question or two to which they'll respond. We'll have a bit of a conversation up here, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Let me take a moment to mic up, and we'll get on with the discussion. Okay, so I'm going to start with Vlad Sokar, um, and you know, to put this in, into uh, context, um, we need to have a better sense of the broad framework of regional energy dynamics uh, and diplomacy into which the May Air Bill announcements fit. Uh, I'd like to ask Vlad to address the question of what the availability of significant amounts of KRG oil and gas, uh, which could become available in the next few years, uh, would mean for things like Turkey's energy needs, Europe's diversification policy, and the concept of a southern energy corridor. Uh, and if you could, Vlad, talk a little bit about whether things like tightening Iran sanctions uh, affect this picture, and how we might expect players like Russia to view the prospect of, of new significant sources of gas and oil becoming available uh, from Iraq, uh, <coughs> including Iraqi Kurdistan. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we might perhaps not have held this panel at this point in time, or perhaps uh, held it in a different form, were it not for the grand design of the European Union, spearheaded specifically by the European Commission, to develop a southern gas corridor from the Caspian Basin and the Middle East to Europe. <coughs> European countries' needs and the southern corridor plan is the motivating factor for ramping up gas production 
in the Caspian Basin and potentially in northern Iraq. This is not to diminish the importance of oil, but oil and gas are different processes. Oil is not a part of the southern corridor to Europe developed by the European Commission. Since 2009, when this concept was developed, uh, the European Union embraced Nabucco as the centerpiece in the proposed corridor. Nabucco, of course, dates back to 2002, but was incorporated into the Southern Corridor design in 2009. By now, Nabucco, in its original form, could, can be considered as dead, with emphasis on the words in its original form. Nabucco is reconfiguring to serve as a shorter pipeline from Bulgaria to the continental gas hub in Baumgarten near Vienna, as a continuation pipeline into Europe from the new entrant into the game. And this new entrant into the game is the Trans-Anatolia Pipeline, an Azerbaijani initiative as a joint Azerbaijani-Turkey project, replacing Nabucco on Turkish territory only, from the Georgia-Turkey border to the Turkey-Bulgaria border. The Trans-Anatolia pipeline can potentially absorb gas volumes from northern Iraq. This idea is not new. It dates back to Nabucco's second stage of development, planning development, post-2006, when the Nabucco, Nabucco project's Austrian management proposed to draw significant gas volumes from northern Iraq through a feeder pipeline from Iraq joining Nabucco on Turkish territory, a pipeline that would have significantly increased Nabucco's already exorbitant construction costs. And it was this idea that contributed to the sinking of Nabucco in its original form, emphasis on the term, on the words in, in its original form. I believe that the trans anatolia pipeline is a viable solution for absorbing future volumes of gas from northern Iraq. First of all, because it is scalable from an initial 10, BC, uh, from an initial 10 BCM per year for, transfer, for uh, delivery to Europe, plus 6 BCM per year to remain in Turkey. The trans anatolia pipeline is scalable to up to 30 BCM per year. Turkish Energy Minister Taner Yıldız has expressed this view that the trans anatolia pipeline is scalable to up to 30 BCM per year, which could also accommodate Turkmen gas coming through a Trans-Caspian pipeline. The European Commission promptly incorporated the trans anatolia pipeline into the gas corridor project as a key segment of that project. In fact, the decisive segment. All other players are accommodating to the entrance of the Trans Anatolia project onto the scene. Even companies such as BP that do not take a favorable view of the Trans Anatolia pipeline for reasons which I may explain later have decided to expand the capacity of the baku tbilisi erzurum pipeline or South Caucasus pipeline from the present 7 BCM per year to 21 BCM per year in order to adapt to the scalable capacity of the Trans-Anatolia pipeline. The European Commission, for some time, and I believe also at the present time, takes a rather skeptical view of gas inputs from northern Iraq. This view may be slightly outdated in Brussels. Perhaps uh, our colleague, pa fellow panelists from KLG, might elucidate this matter. But until very recently, and I believe still now, 
the European Commission believes that gas development and gas exports from northern Iraq are a distant proposition. They think that the Kurdish authorities in northern Iraq assign priority to uh, building local gas-fired power stations working, operating on local gas. The next priority would be supplying similar gas power, sta fired power station in the rest of Iraq. And then exports would be the third priority. There is also a question in the minds of the European Union in Brussels about the cost, the time frame of developing uh, significant volumes of gas in northern Iraq and about the costs of the feeder pipeline, something that contributed to Nabucco's demise. I don't want to sound skeptical. I'm just uh, trying to uh, render what the most recent view, I think also current, but certainly the most recent view in Brussels is. Now, why is the Trans-Anatolia pipeline such a great project in my view? Because it can turn Turkey into a major transit country for gas. And this is largely the merit of Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is succeeding where the European Union, the European Commission, and the Nabucco Consortium uh, have failed. In that, Azerbaijan is prepared to finance up to 80% of the cost of construction of the trans anatolia pipeline, estimated at a total of about $6 billion. The state oil company of Azerbaijan is prepared to finance about 80% of that. It wants to operate the pipeline. Why is the pipeline scalable? It is scalable because it is a linear pipeline under one ownership, one operatorship, and under one legal and regulatory regime. This contrasts with other pro pipeline projects, such as BP's proposed Southeast Europe pipeline, which is a composite of various pipelines, pipeline segments and interconnectors, all the way from Eastern Turkey to Hungary under various legal and regulatory regimes, various technical characteristics, various ownerships, various degrees of wear and tear, very difficult to scale up such a pipeline, involving moreover negotiations for each pipeline segment in each country. That's, what I th that's why I think that the trans anatolia pipeline is such a good project for Turkey. And finally, and I'll, I'll end on this uh, thought, the, pro the pipeline TANAP, abbreviated as TANAP, is designed to accommodate future volumes of Turkmen gas. The European Commission insists on this. Azerbaijan would like to become a transit country for Turkmen gas in addition to becoming a gas producing and exporting country. And therein lies a major opportunity for Turkey to become a transit country for gas. This is a major Turkish national aspiration, and it is fulfillable now. It has been fulfilled with respect to oil, thanks to the pipeline Bakut Tbilisi Ceyhan, operated on Azerbaijani oil. And now Azerbaijan offers Turkey, its fellow Turkish country, the opportunity to become a transit country for gas. And this is why I believe that the Memorandum of Understanding, signed on December 26, 2011, by the two countries needs to be ratified as soon, it needs to be, uh, to become a binding agreement as soon as possible, by June, as some people are saying, and then be promptly ratified by the two parliaments. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. And I, <coughs> you, you, you said a couple of things that people are going to want to come back to, I'm sure, on the panel. Um, I think the overall impression I'm left with, though, is that assuming you can get gas to and across the Turkish border, there will be a place to put it exactly. <laughs> and there will be a market for it exactly. <laughs> in Turkey and beyond. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let me uh, then move, uh, sort of narrow the focus um, with, with John Hanna, if I may, John. Um, your, your article spends a lot of time uh, developing an analysis that relies, uh, uh, that is largely a function of Maliki's eff relentless efforts to consolidate his power uh, in Baghdad and beyond. And that implies that if the prime minister were to change course, were to become a more inclusive politician, 
were to adopt a more, shall we say, statesmanlike strategy of governance. Um, he could stop or reverse the process that we saw on display in Airbull a few weeks ago. So I guess I would ask you, is, is that fair? Um, if, if so, how do you, as someone who's followed Iraq for some time, rate the prospects of, of Prime Minister Maliki changing uh, his modus operandi so radically at this late stage? And um, if he doesn't, and, and Turkey does get to the point where you see hydrocarbons crossing the border, what could Baghdad do about it? Well, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Let me also thank uh, Jim Holmes and the ATC for inviting me here. Jim and I go back a very long way, and it's wonderful to, to see him again. Uh, thanks to the uh, honor to participate with a very distinguished panel, especially with these two former colleagues here, Jim Jeffrey, um, who, I, who I do want to thank for their amazing service to the country, and to Kubad Talibani for equally his service to, to the U.S.-Kurdish relationship, and to wish you both very good luck in your ongoing uh, next phases of your lives and careers. Um, listen, the, you know, it's always dangerous to uh, attribute any very complicated geostrategic game to a single factor analysis. Um, this is a, a very complex chess game, multiple boards being played um, with the various players in the region, I think, um, influenced by and motivated by a large range of competing uh, incentives and fears and concerns and interests. And having said that, you know, I, I do believe that the Prime Minister's governing style, um, what is perceived both inside Iraq by a large number of important constituencies, as well as by a lot of players outside Iraq, and that's important as well, um, see him engaged in, in something of a, of a, of a power grab um, in close alignment with Iran that um, I think has acted as an accelerant for what was already a, a very difficult situation. I mean, let's be real in talking about what's driving the situation that the Kurds for a very long time have had a deep-seated desire for independence long before they ever heard the name of, of Nouri al-Maliki. Um, but the Prime Minister's actions have mattered. I think they have made a complex situation in some ways more difficult to resolve, and they've created choices and possibilities and circumstances that might not otherwise have, have arisen if, in fact, he pursued a different course of governance since the, uh, the formation of his government back in, in 2010. Um, I think it would, we would be facing a, a different situation if the perspectives from Erbil, from Ankara, uh, and from various other locations inside and outside of Iraq would look quite different and people might be facing a different range of, of choices and they might see their, their interests being achieved in a different way if, if events had not taken the course they've taken over the last 18 months or so. Um, you know, could things be reversed or stopped if the prime minister suddenly became a different character if he decided to pursue uh, uh, his governance in a, in a different manner, if in fact he fulfilled all of his obligations under the, the agreement that formed his government, if in fact he fulfilled all his promises to, uh, to the Irakia bloc and, uh, and uh, former Prime Minister Alawi, if he hadn't begun to target or appear to target some of his main political rivals, particularly in the Sunni-dominated uh, uh, blocks of Iraq. Uh, if he reverses all that, I, uh, uh, a, I think it's a very low probability. Um, things have happened. Um, he's done what he's done. You can't put the toothpaste back in the, the tube. People have now five or six years of experience with this man at the helm of the 
the state. I don't think they believe he will change in any fundamental matter, that his strategic course in terms of his own position is quite, quite set, and frankly, the levels of trust, always, always low, are I, th are I think largely burned by, by this point in time. But also having said that, I'd say that are there things Maliki could do that would still affect the calculations of the different players in the regions? Are there cards that he has to play? Are there incentives that he could offer to basically divide and conquer? This loose coalition that's now arrayed against him? I think almost certainly. Um, I think a lot of people have, have underestimated the prime minister. I think he's, he's proven to be quite a savvy political player at times, especially with his back to the wall, that he's uh, demonstrated the capability when necessary to, through various means of intimidation, fear, bribery, various incentives that he can offer, um, that he has been able to, to pick off his, his opponents. Um, and that's certainly the case, and that in terms of this coalition that's currently arrayed against him, um, it's hard to see other than their opposition to Maliki, <coughs> which may or may not be enough depending on how Maliki plays his cards, um, hard to see how otherwise their interests overlap. Um, so I think there are, are things that Maliki could, could do. Um, particularly, I think there are things he, he might still do to take the steam out of the, out of the Turkish uh, opposition to his rule. Um, there are things that he could do to get, <coughs> perhaps get the United States to be, uh, to be more engaged again um, on the Kurdish side and trying to make sure that none of this spirals too far out of control. Um, if he doesn't do it, what options does he have? Um, I mean, I suppose there's a range, but things, he, he controls a lot of resources, controls access to a lot of resources in Iraq, that there are a lot of companies in the Gulf, in Turkey, uh, in the United States would like uh, to be in play for. He can deny those. He can cut off financing to the Kurds. A variety of pressures he can, he can bring to bear up to and including, I suppose, various forms of military pressure. Um, and games of chicken he can play in trying to destabilize the region uh, and get other people to, uh, uh, to intervene on his behalf, to bring greater pressure to bear on, on whatever alignment is emerging between, uh, between Erbil and, and Ankara. So I, I think Maliki still feels like he's probably in a relatively strong position that uh, the unity of the, of the opposition arrayed against him is uh, maybe quite wide, but it's, 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 it's not very deep. And uh, if need be, there are a number of cards that he can, he can still play to, uh, uh, to stop this from, from going to the, to the next, next phase. And, and those, those cards conceivably could either be in terms of intimidation, threat, consequences of a negative sort or uh, a renewal of, of some of the things that were on offer when the government was formed in the first place, uh, an oil bill, a revenue sharing bill, um, as, and essentially buying off the Kurds again to, to, to bring them back into the fold. Yeah, I think there are things he can do with Turkey, but I think there are lots of private deals that can be cut as well with all of the players in this. Um, that would take the steam out of, uh, uh, I mean, if this, if this, if this is a, a, a showdown between Maliki and a reasonably well-united Kurdish Sunni Shia component bloc against him, backed up by powerful international players, first and foremost Turkey, uh, with the United States maybe somewhat ambivalent, that's a much different scenario uh, than simply a, a standoff between the Kurds and, and Baghdad, in which everybody else is, uh, is either looking on or, or not supportive of Kurdish aspirations. We may come back to that when my colleague to the left uh, has a chance to speak. Uh, let, let's move on to, uh, to you, Kubad. Um, I want to pose a couple of questions to you, if I may. Um, you do double duty, d double duty this morning. The first has to do with sort of a reality check. Um, 
so far let's face it most of what we're talking about today has been words mainly from kurdish representatives um, and body language um, and i get that the question i have is how confident is air bill that the agreements that minister have rami announced um, have a basis to them that they will happen uh, and in what time frame and to, to, to narrow this really sharply you know when when could one reasonably expect the first trucks to cross the border with food or or product that's question one I'll let you mull that for a second while I hand you an even worse one <laughs> um, and, and it's this a lot of the discussion about Turkey's opening its border has has tended to view this, and John, you do this in your article uh, to some extent, as a as a giant step toward an independent Kurdistan. Um, the I word has already been used today. Um, it's frankly hard for me to conceive, as someone who's watched Turkey for a dozen years or so now, of of Turkish leaders being part of such a scenario, a, a scenario that ends with an independent Kurdistan on the map. Uh, and I've noted that Minister Havrami, for example, has been very careful uh, to emphasize that anything the KRG does is going to be done in terms of conformity to Iraq's constitution. So the, what occurs to me as I look at this is, is, don't a lot of the analysts have it exactly backward? And isn't it the case that an implicit piece of Turkey's going ahead with this kind of a scenario would have to be Kurdistan's remaining within the constitutional framework of, of a unified Iraq. Two really nasty questions, thank, but that's no, what you're paid you for, right? Thank, <laughs> thank you, Ambassador. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Again, like John, I'm um, honored to be on this distinguished panel. Ambassador Tan, it's great to, to have you here. And um, it's also, I think, a sign of where we are today that we're even having this discussion. Mm -hmm. Because who would have thought 10, 15 years ago that the Middle East would be in turmoil, that dictatorships would be overthrown, that the one area where people actually expected conflict between Kurds and Turks um, was now the one good news story um, to come out of this part of the world. So I think that's a testament to the leadership of both Turkey and the Kurdistan region. Um, and I think it's a, it's a positive development. And on this, um, the issue of the, the pipeline, I, I think, again, this is, this is a decision that should be held. It's a decision that should be supported. It, it, is, a, it is a big step forward that Turkey is the, and even entertaining this idea. Um, and what we've tried to say all along is this isn't a zero-sum game. This is not something that's being taken away from Iraq. Um, in, in, in opposite, this is actually something that will contribute um, to Iraq reaching its lofty goals of oil exports. Um, and and th this, just the fact that this is happening doesn't need to automatically make it a bad thing for Iraq. And we've tried to reassure some of our American friends um, that have been a bit skittish about this issue um, that this is happening, this is going ahead. This is, this, is, this is not just an agreement between two entities, um, with, you know, one in Iraqi Kurdistan and one in Turkey. This is, a dis this is an agreement that has been struck at the highest level um, highest level in Turkey and the highest level in the Kurdistan region. And the goal is, as you said, Mark, you know, not, to cr not to do this so Kurdistan becomes independent. Because you and I know, I doubt very much that Turkey would, would do anything that would lead to an independent Kurdistan. On the contrary, you know, right now Kurdistan is, you know, has the ability to produce 175,000 barrels of oil. In the grand scheme of things, when we're talking about Iraq's production of two and a half million, 2.7, 2.8 million, it's not that big a deal. But when we're talking about producing half a million, a million, a million and a half, and potentially two million, with an independent <coughs> export route, that's a whole new ball game. That changes the nature of the discussions between us and Baghdad. Then I can see there'll be a completely different way in how Baghdad is going to be speaking with us about finalizing an oil law, finalizing a revenue sharing law. Because this is a lot of oil that is going to be guaranteed into the international market. You know, and we've always said, if Iraq reaches its stated goals, whether it's 5 million, 7 million, or even the 12 million that occasionally we hear about, great, fantastic. It's a win-win. We're part of Iraq. We get our share. Everybody's happy. But what if Iraq, what if Iraq doesn't? 
What if the bureaucracy prevents Iraq from reaching its goals? What if external powers prevent Iraq from succeeding? What if the situation, the political situation in Iraq continues to unravel the way that it does? You know, I, I wasn't euphoric a couple of weeks or a month or so ago when Iraq announced that it has an extra 150,000 barrels of oil to put into the market. I know some in Washington were, because that, that's nothing. That's a drop in the hat to what Iraq can do. Iraq should be producing millions of more barrels of oil per day, but not with this vision, not with this current plan, not with this current cast of characters running the show, and certainly not with the current terms that's being offered to the international oil companies. So if Iraq doesn't reach these targets, what we're doing in Kurdistan will ultimately balance out the market and will provide a steady flow of crude into the international markets through a strategic partner like Turkey. Um, and that's why I think this is, this is much bigger. Uh, this is a very strategic project um, from our side, from the Turkish side, and one that we, um, we're confident that will be done. Ashley Harami is, is, uh, is cracking the whip um, as, as he can, and he wants, he wants our end of the pipeline to be done within 12 months. Um, obviously, he has limited role in how quickly the, the Turkish side of the pipeline uh, gets completed. Um, but that's the kind of time frame that we're going in. And um, there's nothing illegal about building a pipeline um, in a country. And can you tell us when we should expect the first trucks to cross the border? Um, well, that, that's a different thing because that, that is tied into the Iraqi okay. situation. Um, because right now, the, the oil that's being produced is being sold on the local market right. um, for domestic purposes. Um, but you know, we're saying to Baghdad, here is oil, we can put it into the national pipeline, we can contribute to Iraq's export, we can contribute to the increasing Iraq's treasury, but we can't do it for free. That just doesn't happen anywhere in the world. Why should it happen to Kurdistan? Um, so pay us, we'll keep putting it in, we'll increase what we can put in but it's got to come as part of an agreement. It's got to come as part of a framework, um, and a framework that I, I believe will only come to fruition when we are producing more than what we are today. Very good. Well, Ambassador Jeffrey, um, you're, I guess, if barely still in government livery, so there's probably some limits to what you can say in terms of total candor, but not for long, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and you, know, you, having been in Ankara and in Baghdad uh, extensively over the years, you have a unique perspective on these issues, which I know everybody here values. And it, you know, it won't be a surprise to you that, that a lot of people, when they talk about this, talk about a lack of clarity on where Washington stands on the dynamics of what we've been talking about here. Everybody's for the unity of Iraq. Um, you've heard that from every part of the spectrum here this morning. Um, but it doesn't take you very far when you're talking about an emerging KRG Turkish effort to change the rules in a way they portray as consistent with Iraq's constitution and, and, and consistent with keeping the country together. So months after Exxon signed its deal with the KRG, I, I, the, you know, I can tell you personally the, 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 the view of U.S. policy towards this and, and similar uh, questions is awfully nuanced. Um, you're not a guy who's known for your nuance, <laughs> and I would be delighted if you could bring some clarity to this situation. Do you, do you, as someone who served in Turkey and in Baghdad, think the border will open in the months ahead? Should it? Um, what would your expectation be in terms of a Washington reaction? And what difference is that? What difference would Washington's reaction at this stage, and given the state of our current influence on the ground, make on the ground uh, as we do its quickly? Pick up any one of those you want to start. Okay, thank you, Mark. Once again, let me join my colleagues here in uh, uh, thanking um, APC, Jim, uh, for inviting us here. This is obviously a very important um, uh, topic, uh, one that is much on the mind of people in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, you've uh, given me a challenge to speak clearly. I'll try to, but in order to do that, I would have to... Uh, uh, make three general comments or otherwise my uh, clear statements might be taken out of context and uh, uh, not have the desired result. Uh, first of all, uh, we're basically talking about uh, largely the specific question of 
hydrocarbons going from uh, the territory of the state of Iraq to the state of Turkey. Is that correct? Uh, the interesting thing is, as I look at the uh, four of us here, I see no representative of the two countries who would presumably, one would think in normal international intercourse, be uh, queried about that, the government of Turkey and the government of uh, Iraq. Uh, no one is up here. Now, having been uh, uh, ambassador of the United States to both Turkey and to Iraq, there may be a temptation on the part of some to figure that I can work in local parenthesis of Iraq or Iraq and Turkey, and I assure you I can't. But I can tell you a little bit about how America looks at this. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, as we've heard today, uh, particularly by our first uh, panelist, the uh, development of Turkish economic relations with both Iraq as a whole and Kurdistan is an extraordinarily important and an extraordinarily positive development. It should be encouraged in every way possible. And we are doing this particularly in the security area with a whole variety of uh, trilateral security and other mechanisms uh, uh, with the Kurds and the Kurdistan regional government, with Baghdad and with um, the Turkey, particularly in the fight against the PKK, but it has other uh, implications and other uh, areas of focus as well. Secondly, uh, as Mark and I both know, because we've devoted a fair amount of our lives to this, uh, developing Turkey as a strategic energy corridor, be it the kirkuk jehan pipeline from the 1980s, be it the pipeline from Azerbaijan to Jehan in the 1990s, be it the current uh, plans for gas corridors is also extremely important both to continue the development of Turkey as a strategic ally and as a major player, which is in the advantage of everyone, including the United States, and frankly, to move uh, oil and gas in a secure way, and Turkey is a secure way compared to uh, various other options, including the Straits of Hormuz, uh, to the West, to the entire global market. Thirdly, uh, there are many issues related to uh, the specific question you've asked me, Mark, uh, on hydrocarbons between Kurdistan and the central government, be it the hydrocarbons law, be it the revenue sharing law, be it various agreements that have been held up or not been held up, be it uh, commitments in the parliamentary budget of uh, 2012, the 175,000 barrels to be shipped uh, on the uh, Jehan uh, uh, pipeline, be it the reasons why those oil shipments were cut, be it the questions of compensation for the, uh, at least uh, uh, the costs of producing that oil, uh, be it uh, the current uh, uh, gridlock on providing part of the product uh, uh, from uh, the south to uh, <coughs> Kurdistan, These are, and be it the many contracts that American firms and Turkish firms and other firms have in the north, and what their status is in the eyes of Baghdad, in the eyes of the Kurds, in the eyes of America and such. These are all very complex uh, questions. They're also tied up in the larger political questions in which uh, at the time um, the Kurdistan uh, regional government as a political force in Baghdad, and it is a major political force in Baghdad with among other things uh, some uh, 60 Kurdish seats in the 325 uh, seat parliament uh, and of course the uh, uh, position of the president and the foreign minister are held by uh, members of the two major Kurdish parties. So it is a major player in Baghdad, and there is a current uh, power struggle between uh, uh, major elements of the party politic in Baghdad, including the Kurds and the, uh, Prime Minister Maliki on Maliki's future. Uh, so all of these things are tied up, and it is a real jumble. Even people who work on them all the time, like I do, have a hard time sorting them all out. And they influence the question that you've asked. But now, after taking up most of the time that you've allotted me, I'll try to ask, uh, answer the question. Uh, this is kind of a duh question. Countries, central governments control their exports. That's the case in the United States. Uh, natural gas, we issue licenses to export it. I don't know the specifics in the case of Turkey, but I would suspect that it's uh, the case with Turkey, too. Uh, as you usually need a license from the government to do almost anything. Uh, in terms of Iraq, I'm a little uncomfortable making pronouncements about what's constitutional and what isn't constitutional uh, with Iraq because 
uh, Americans and other foreigners do that, it's a little bit uh, awkward uh, because Iraqis basically should do that. And in fact, they have a, uh, a democratically established uh, and approved by an overwhelming majority of the uh, population um, institution, the constitutional court, that can do this. So maybe somebody should bring it to the constitutional court. But once again, to get to uh, the answer, we have great problems with the very concept of uh, hydrocarbons being exported from Kurdistan even as a yeah, uh, to uh, Turkey or any place else without the permission of the central government. Again, it's a sort of duh factor. That's what central governments do is control their borders and control trade. But uh, as the question keeps on coming up or the constitution is thrown around, I'm not going to make a pronouncement. I just said five, well, a minute ago I wouldn't. But I'll just read to the audience certain excerpts from the constitution and you all decide, okay? Uh, so, uh, Article 110. The federal government shall have exclusive authorities in the following matters. Formulating customs policy. Regulating commercial policy, I think that includes trade, across regional and government boundaries in Iraq. Presumably they mean between a region and a foreign country as much as between a region and a province or between two provinces. Uh, and uh, negotiating, signing, and ratifying sovereign economic and trade policy. One of the recent ones they did with the European Union, I think in March of 2011, between Iraq and the European Union, which may or may not impact Turkey because of Turkey's customs union with the European Union, makes it very explicit that only the central government can authorize the export of hydrocarbons. Okay, Article 111. Oil and gas are owned by all the people of Iraq in all the regions and governments. Article 112. The federal government, the first of article, the federal government with the product producing governance and regional governments shall undertake the management of oil and gas extracted from present fields. This is a present fields clause. Presumably, uh, management of oil and gas includes policy on exporting it. Secondly, this is the new fields clause. The federal government with the producing regional and governing governments shall together formulate the necessary strategic policies to develop the oil and gas wealth. Uh, that's a somewhat more liberal provision because you have the, uh, uh, I would say that's an adverb, together, which is not in the first clause. And uh, many people, including we, interpret that to mean that uh, with new fields, the uh, provinces and governments, in this case, uh, uh, and regional governments, the KRG, has a bigger role in doing this. But still, the federal government does too. So presumably, uh, this is not something that the, a regional government can decide on its own. And therefore, we would be, once again, concern. Uh, that's the legality of it. Uh, the politics of it are very, very complicated as well. First of all, uh, all exports of oil, all exports of oil and earnings thereof from Iraq are covered by relevant UN Security Council resolutions under Chapter 7 involving payment of 5% to the UN Compensation Commission for Kuwait. And, uh, that certainly uh, is the current international law and it will continue. So that raises a very special problem and issue, including for the United States as a member of the Security Council. Uh, in terms of what will happen, I don't want to speculate on, uh, gee, what, how things would uh, develop uh, were such exports to begin without the permission of the central government. The things that we would be worrying about in Washington would be, first of all, the reaction of the central government, particularly the $11 billion uh, oil subsidy that is provided largely from oil shipped out of the South to the Kurdistan regional government based upon the 11, uh, excuse me, the 17%, 83% split of all oil earnings. Uh, we would be very worried about that. We would be worried despite what people might say that they are not uh, engaging in uh, a road towards independence, 
we would be very troubled that people in Baghdad, and particularly Arabs in the disputed areas that are de facto governed by Kurdish authorities, uh, might see it differently. It's one thing if you're an Arab in the disputed areas being governed by our uh, local Kurdish de facto police and other officials inside a largely Arab Iraq. It may be another thing if you are going to be an Arab uh, in an area governed by uh, Kurdish authorities, which uh, will be claimed as part of a separate majority Kurdish population state. These are very, very worrying things. The United States went in in 2003, and after much trouble uh, in 2004, obtained the support of the entire Security Council for a new policy on Iraq, which said Iraq would be democratic, federal, pluralistic, and united. Those are the four terms that the Security Council laid out. Those four terms have been reflected in the Iraqi Constitution, supported by a vast majority of the Iraqi people, including a vast majority of the population of Kurdistan. And this point was lastly, uh, was most recently made clear uh, in both private comments and a uh, public statement by the White House during President Barzani's visit to the United States. That is, we very much value, as we do, our special relationship with uh, the Kurdistan regional government, but this is within the framework of our strategic partnership with Iraq as a unified country. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Jim. That's done. Are you hearing me? Yeah. That scrapes off some of the nuance um, down to some, some good, sharp, hard edges, and, and I, that's a very useful contribution uh, to the discussion. I mean, as you laid out, you know, some of the questions surrounding the Constitution, even in simply reading through it, um, you were obliged to add some parenthetical comments which suggest that there's a lot of room for interpretation here. I suspect that Kubad would, would probably agree with that, and I'd like to give him a chance to provide a, uh, a, a Kurdish view of, of that problem. Thank you. Um, I don't, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on it briefly. I, I think we could spend weeks debating the Constitution and every clause and every, and every um, wordage, but I think the, the key distinction in the Constitution is the distinction that's made between producing fields at the time that the Constitution was written and unproducing fields. And it was a clever language that was used that made that distinction that stipulates that produ producing fields, i.e. the fields in Kirkuk, are to be produced by the federal government or administered by the federal government with the producing region. The fact that there was a distinction between producing fields and new fields or no uh, non-producing fields um, gives us, per the Constitution, um, in another article that states anything that's not explicitly stated in the Constitution as an exclusive power of the federal government is a, a, is a power for the region. Uh, that gives us the authority to go ahead and do what we do, do what we've done. But don't take my word for it because I'm biased. Take the word of 48 international oil companies that have come into Kurdistan, including America's very own ExxonMobil, which probably has a much bigger legal team than my office in Washington does, that have scoured the Constitution, that have looked at the Kurdistan oil and gas law, that have looked at what is to do and what's not to do. And that's why they're in Kurdistan. That's why they're staying in Kurdistan. And that's why many more will come to Kurdistan from countries like the United States and Turkey and France and many others as well. And that's why we welcome them too. Well, I, we, we won't make this into a seminar on the Kurdish uh, constitution as it applies to energy issues, but uh, I think Jim will, will want to comment particularly on the Exxon piece of that. Yeah. Um, but just generally, uh, you remember my third condition, I think, general condition was I didn't want to get into all of the larger set of issues that can impact on this. There's a very specific issue of exporting hydrocarbons across borders. Let me take, and I will be giving you my own personal view on this one because this isn't the formulated position of the U.S. government, but on uh, Article 112. Article 112 does make a difference, as it should, between current fields, which have been administered by a former regime, uh, and uh, in several senses of the word regime, uh, and fields that are to be developed anew. Clearly, and I don't think we would doubt this, it's one reason why we don't come right out and say that the contracts that the Kurdistan regional government has signed with uh, uh, various foreign companies, including American companies, are illegal, uh, because uh, 
it's an ambiguous area given Article 112, uh, Paragraph 2. We just caution uh, U.S. firms when they ask us, uh, which was not the case with ExxonMobil, that uh, uh, you have to be very careful because it is not clear exactly what that means. But, for example, uh, I could make a case personally that, uh, that uh, you could interpret that reasonably to mean that production sharing agreements, if the regional government or the provincial government was willing to accept those, would be the way to go, given it's very difficult to develop oil in mountainous areas. Uh, uh, whereas for the current fields, uh, the current procedures, which have been in the old uh, regime and, and currently with the new Iraqi government uh, uh, technical service agreements, uh, that there's more latitude on that. But that doesn't open the door to, once again, calling into question what is, forget the Iraqi constitution, the standard procedure internationally that countries control their own borders and they control what goes over their own borders, particularly if it's a strategic commodity like oil and particularly if it's 95% of the GDP. I mean, duh, once again. But if you want, I will go back and I'm sorry if I was not uh, clear and I tried to um, uh, editorialize on the constitutional issues. It's very clear. The central government controls trade policy international trade policy. The central government controls customs. The central government signs international economic agreements. Uh, that's not Jeffrey's editorializing or U.S. government caveating. That's what the Constitution says. Again, uh, the uh, uh, Constitution does say that uh, uh, when there are divided, this is Article 115, divided uh, responsibilities, uh, which are laid out in Article 114. Article 115 then talks about that in a dispute, it's the uh, uh, regional government or the provincial government that has the priority. However, I would say, and I'm not a lawyer, that that almost certainly applies to the preceding Article 114. And that the other articles from 110 on, which are under the uh, section heading of powers of the federal government, our federal government powers and 115 doesn't apply to anything other than 114, but that, again, is a uh, 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 technical question. And the um, issues that I talked about as far as customs and other things, these are explicitly uh, exclusive powers of the central government where 115 would never apply and no lawyer would think it would apply. In terms of ExxonMobil and these other 48, uh, they never were asked, unless you know something I don't about these contracts, because we haven't seen all of them. They were never asked, and they were never signed a contract that uh, stipulates that they will export to Turkey uh, via Kurdistan regional government uh, determinations. They're producing oil, which uh, up until recently was being provided uh, to the uh, Iraqi central government to be exported via the Baku, uh, by, rather the uh, uh, Kurd uh, Kirkuk Jehan pipeline. Uh, so I don't think that the fact that a uh, ExxonMobil lawyer or a lawyer from uh, uh, Hunt or Marathon or any other company decided, or even that Ganell Energy, even Ganell Energy decided that this contract was legal, has anything to do with whether the oil produced by that contract would be exported. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you know something different, please let me know, uh, and then we would go back to the lawyers, at least the American ones, and have a chat with them. There, was, there was nothing in my comment that that connected the production side of these companies work to the export side. Right, and I'm only uh, talking about the exports so here. I I'm talking sure. about the production. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, talking I'm about the, the constitutional yeah, framework okay. that, that regulates the, the production yeah. side of things. But the constitution is a, is a document, it's a living document. Um, unfortunately, the federal government, we can, we can uh, you know, we d again, I don't want to take this to the constitution because there's bigger issues at play here, but it, it's, there, it's, it's not right for the federal government to cherry pick which articles of the constitution it wants to apply and which articles of the constitution it wants to neglect. This, is, this has got to be done within the framework of the constitution, but also in the spirit of partnership in this country. And you, you've somebody, you're somebody uh, been the, that's devoted a lot of your time to trying to make this country work. Um, but my, my fear is this country is, is, is not working. Well, and suffice it's clear it, to suffice everybody to right that now. There is a a difference over the const interpretation of the Constitution on these issues, which will likely persist, and and um, everybody who's involved in this has their own lawyers. Uh, I can I can tell you <laughs> that Ganell Energy's lawyers will, are, are prepared to to argue 
persuasively that these are legally binding contracts um, fully in accord with international law and enforceable. My argument that, is that's that a biased position too. <laughs> but my argument is that, that our actions right now will lead to resolving an issue with Baghdad because yeah. when we're talking about exporting half a million or a million barrels of oil a day, this is a million barrels of oil a day that Baghdad needs, right. that the international market needs. And we're going to get there. And I want to reassure a good friend, Jim, I want to reassure you in the audience, it will work itself out. Let, me, let me just one comment, Mark. Um, Last comment. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm not uh, challenging the instrumentalization of oil policy to have a political impact in Baghdad. That may be a good idea, it may not be a good idea, but it seems to be out there. It's one of the many things that are out there. Secondly, I want to make it clear, I'm not challenging the legality of these contracts, particularly under 112. I'm challenging the constitutional legality of exporting oil without the permission of the central government. If those contracts contain provisions that say that that is the case, then I think those contracts would be questionable, but my understanding is they don't. So therefore, it's apples and oranges when one says we have questions about the constitutionality of an export of oil, and somebody says, but wait, uh, Janelle lawyers or Exxon lawyers have approved these contracts. Well, so what? They haven't approved these contracts, which, unless, again, I'm mistaken, allow uh, for the explicit export of uh, uh, oil or gas or anything else that uh, associated with hydrocarbon without the permission of the central government. Okay. So that's the issue, and that's a very specific issue. Got it. Um, Kabat, uh, John, this is for you, um, has suggested that, as in Jim's words, uh, uh, hydrocarbons are being instrumentalized basically as part of a political discussion with Baghdad, and, and Kabat has assured us this is all going to work out. Um, if it doesn't, <laughs> if ju just if it doesn't, um, Jim has hinted at some of the things that could happen uh, if it doesn't. Uh, Eleven billion dollars in subsidies could be cut off. Um, I'll add one: uh, um, oil shipped through the Kirkuk Dayan pipeline could stop running. Uh, that's a significant hit to Turkey. Um, would it happen? Would they do it? Would it? As someone who studied this, this area for a while, would it have any impact on the players who would be the objects of these retaliatory moves if it got to that? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's hypothetical. It's hypothetical. It's, uh, but these are questions of, of timing. I mean, Kubad can talk to this. My impression is that um, the Kurdistan regional government is, uh, has, a, has a dual track policy here. I think that they have <coughs> For most of the time since 2003, um, sort of bowed to the to the geopolitical reality that all of Iraq's neighbors, most importantly Turkey, as well as their patron in the United States and most of their fellow citizens in Iraq, want this country to stay unified and insist that the Kurdistan regional government, the Kurds, remain part of a federal democratic unified Iraq. And I think that that the KRG for the most part um, and most of its officials have quite responsibly uh, recognized that reality, recognized the, the balance of forces that exist and, uh, and have tried to, um, to move within that framework um, on the proviso that they are going to, uh, to never return to the situation that existed pre-2003 in terms of their status inside of Iraq that they are going to, to work very, very hard to ensure that their economic, political, and, and their physical survival is, uh, is no longer at the, uh, at the whim and mercy of, uh, of any particular regime in Baghdad. That experience was a very, very bad one, uh, almost uh, 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 existential at one point for the Kurds, and they're not going to put themselves into that position Again, therefore, um, on the concern and fear, quite legitimate, that this grand experiment of democracy and federalism I in Iraq is not going to work, I think that the Kurds, their policy at the same time is to put themselves in maximal position that if the 
this whole house of cards come crumbling down, that they will be in the best position possible to take care of themselves outside of this current paradigm that we've all been operating under since 2003. And I think that the, the work with the oil companies, the contracts that they've signed, uh, uh, what they've done with Turkey, which is quite remarkable and quite a game changer, I think, and what they've done most recently on these pipelines is all in a matter of course of putting themselves in a position where they do have an option to exercise a policy and a strategy for some kind of new status outside the two 2003 paradigm if, if push comes, comes to shove. I do believe that increasingly within the highest levels of the Kurdistan regional government, there is a belief that the center will not hold uh, that the current situation they're in um, is not one that can be sustained and last over time. There needs to be some kind of fundamental changes in Baghdad in terms of their relationship with Baghdad, that the trend line for events is quite bad. And I think that has accelerated this move to put themselves in a position where they can exercise this new option and achieve some kind of new status in conjunction with a very close relationship with Turkey. Whether or not that's possible from the Turkish perspective is a separate separate question. I don't think it's possible at 175,000 barrels a day, but would it be possible at a million barrels a day? At that point, the $10 billion, $11 billion coming from Baghdad to subsidize the Kurdish budget when you're talking oil at $100 a barrel and a million barrels, much less 2 million barrels a day in 2019? Do the math. Um, do the math. Um, the whole ball game changes. Hopefully, I think I hope Kubat is right that it changes in a way that actually has a positive impact on that Erbil ba Baghdad dynamic, and Maliki or some successor government in Baghdad kind of wakes up and realizes that it's got to uh, pursue a much more accommodating approach, and that federalism, real, genuine, democratic federalism in which the Kurds do exercise significant autonomy over their own economics and security and their politics is going to be the reality of the new Iraq. It's something that hasn't existed in the Middle East, much less the Arab Middle East, as, as far as I'm aware. So it's a completely new model, whether or not it's achievable in this vortex of, of Iraq you know, remains to be seen. But for the Kurds to be skeptical of that and to be developing all their options for all the contingencies that may exist, I think um, makes a lot of sense. And one can see as this plays out over time and Achi and uh, the President and Prime Minister in Kurdistan, <laughs> uh, I, I would not um, underestimate them. I would not underestimate the strategic vision they have and the very methodical way they've put into place a number of steps, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, that only a few years ago, any of us, including the Turkish experts, would have been amazed that this relationship has progressed this far. And, and, and the Turks must know that even by entertaining this discussion of independent exports uh, from Kurdistan to Turkey, at these quantities, that they are um, pouring jet fuel on the fire speculation about um, at some point in the not too distant future, uh, the status of Kurdistan within Iraq changing in fairly significant and fundamental ways. Yeah. I'm gonna broaden the, the, the focus uh, a bit to conclude here. Jim's giving me the hindsight <laughs> and we have about uh, five minutes <laughs> left. Who the heck can you yeah. Uh, do I have one time for one more intervention, or are you going to pull me off? I'm going to turn you off. Okay. Glad. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> Thanks to the panel. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. And, and my th